Welcome everyone. Thanks for taking the time to join in on this educational session as part of the Maryland State Firemen's Association's annual conference, 2020 virtual conference. Certainly are challenging times and this is certainly an exceptional opportunity to still be able to uh, put some of our programs on that uh, many of us would have been uh, again in Ocean City as part of the annual conference. Um, standing in front of many of you uh, and presenting uh, accordingly. Uh, certainly want to thank uh, all of the staff at the association, uh, the executive board, the executive officers, and those that are working both in front and behind the scenes to make this virtual conference a reality for all of you to still be able to provide some very valuable educational insights from many of the instructors and presenters that, again, would have been part of the conference uh, uh, there in Ocean City. It's really, uh, again, from my standpoint, it's, it's an honor and a pr privilege to be part of this. I think you'll find an exceptional uh, opportunity here as we go into our educational session here this, uh, in this particular program. Um, our program is Reading the Buildings and Building Facts. Uh, I'm your host, Chris Naum. For those of you that don't know me, again, uh, I will talk a little bit more about that in a, in a few minutes. But again, if you have not had the opportunity to uh, take any of these types of virtual programs uh, online. These are certainly very exceptional. We hope to make this a very rewarding experience for you. So sit back, uh, enjoy yourself. We'll go through some of the insights here. We're going to swap over here in a moment into our PowerPoint program. So again, uh, thank you very, very much for taking the time to sit in on this educational session of taking it to the streets, buildings on fire, and again, building facts, reading the building. Our program is on this particular educational session, Buildings on Fire, Reading the Building Insights and Building Facts. And again, I'm your host, Christopher Naum. Again, uh, an exceptional opportunity. This is gonna be interesting to see how we do this presentation here without any interactive uh, activities from our, uh, our, our normal cadre of uh, participants in the classroom setting. But uh, again, you have an opportunity to sit back and uh, for the next 90 or so minutes, uh, Listen in on some insights. So we're gonna talk about reading the building, providing some insights and give you some uh, uh, different uh, uh, information on the concept and the modeling and the methodologies of building facts, F-A-C-T-S. Again, this is all part of uh, providing some insights to give us a tactical edge on today's fire ground. Today's fire ground, certainly more than any other time in the past, uh, is more demanding uh, and certainly has, uh, uh, a lessening degree of uh, margin for errors. We just don't have the latitude anymore to uh, mess up on today's fire ground, which again, we'll talk more about, again, some of these insights here in this particular uh, session, uh, provide some different pieces uh, that help support the continuing aspects of uh, knowledge, information, skill sets that culminate together on the fire ground in a dynamic way but again, uh, provide us with some insights on today's demands associated with today's buildings on fire. Again, I can't stress enough about uh, my appreciation to the executive board and all of the staff that's involved in putting this virtual fire conference together. Certainly a very uh, challenging year for all of us, first responders working in the streets, and again, all of the associations and educational institutions and organizations throughout the state and throughout the United States that are trying to maintain some uh, continuity and uh, provide some good insights and educational uh, information for those of you that uh, need to have a continuing aspect toward that. So sit back again and enjoy our program. For those of you that don't know me, again, my name is Christopher Naum. I have been uh, teaching and instructing for well over 35 years nationally, taught all the way from the local to national to international level across the United States and internationally on a global basis. Uh, 43 plus years on, on the fire service and in the job. And again, quite a bit of uh, background and information. I had the good fortune of operating in a variety of different capacities over that time frame. Again, worked as both a uh, firefighter, fire officer in the streets, worked in the academy set, uh, settings, worked at the National Fire Academy as an adjunct instructor first starting off in 1982 
and uh, also concurrently with those activities, work both as an architect, fire protection engineer, and a firefighter in the various uh, elements and so forth. So again, hopefully some of you are aware of some of my writings I've written for both Fire Engineering and Firehouse Magazine for many, many years. And again, continue to offer quite a bit of, uh, of, of um, presentations on the national level at all of the major fire conferences and then regionally throughout the United States, uh, again, on the uh, state and regional level. Um, the only other thing to add to that, uh, I've really had the privilege and pleasure to, uh, and honor really to uh, have been working with the uh, group of inst uh, investigators at NIOSH as part of the uh, firefighter uh, uh, line of duty death program, worked as a technical advisor and subject matter expert and have had the privilege to work on a number of, of line of duty death investigations, primarily focusing in on the building construction, fire dynamics, building performance related uh, issues affecting the adverse outcomes of that particular event. So you can take a look at some of the other insights online. You can certainly do a Google search to, uh, to give you some of that uh, perspective on, on uh, my background and so forth. Much of what we're going to talk about here within our program is also available online. Uh, spent about 27 years with uh, Firehouse Magazine, both uh, in terms of uh, Firehouse, the magazine, and Firehouse.com. Much of uh, some of those writings are still available online. If you go to Firehouse.com, uh, just do a quick search with my last name. You'll find a, a number of articles that were part of our Buildings on Fire column for many years talking about predictability of building performance and buildings on fire, and that'll give you some insights. And again, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about some uh, websites and uh, some things here that you can revert back to that'll provide some insights uh, and further help support some of the uh, concepts that we'll be presenting here today. We do a radio program for those of you who are interested uh, in tuning in both on a monthly basis and then sometimes a little bit more frequently on fireengineering.com, blog talk radio. Um, it's taking it to the streets, buildings on fire, it's a series that we've been doing for quite a number of years. We actually started off uh, well over 10 years ago independently uh, doing Buildings on Fire as part of an independent uh, program with Taking to the Streets. So some of those programs are still available on our various blog and websites. But again, we do offer a very robust series of some very in-depth programs on fireengineering.com on the Blog Talk Radio. Take a look at the archives. And again, you'll find some uh, very insightful programs. All of these are dealing with building construction, case studies, and the insights dealing with today's fire ground and the buildings that we are operating within. One of the things that uh, the pandemic certainly put a, uh, a major <laughs> uh, kibosh on uh, was we were doing uh, a series of programs that started off and we actually started off in December of last year taking to the streets. Uh, we did street walks in New York City. We rolled off our first program of reading the buildings. These were walking tours that were occurring right in uh, downtown Manhattan this uh, past December along uh, with a group of about uh, 25 uh, participants. Uh, chief uh, Danny Sheraton and I, Danny Sheraton is a battalion chief with the 3rd Battalion FDNY in the Bronx. Danny is, a, again, a well-read, well well-known instructor, both nationally, FDIC, and again, both he and I uh, talked a little bit about uh, putting some of these programs on that we were doing independently, and again, reading the buildings and the walking tours became a reality. We're hoping to kick these things back off again, um, depending upon how the circumstances arise here the latter part of this fall, so keep an eye out for some of these uh, opportunities as we promote and uh, put those informational uh, items out on our websites and social media. We hope to con start conducting again our street tours. These are comprehensive walking tours, reading buildings, taking a look at insights in the streets. We uh, selected New York City only because of the vastness of building types, everything from the, the uh, four or five story tenements, the walk up brownstones, the townhouses, all the way up to the uh, super tall high rises that New York City has to offer and everything in between. Phenomenal opportunity. We did a, a 60 block walking tour. It was a full day type opportunity, but what better place to take the classroom into the streets uh, in the streets of New York. So keep an eye on that. We talked about construction operations, command tactical insights, which is again, one of our program has evolved here today in this educational opportunity. 
but uh, keep an eye out for those. Again, non-commercial. Again, these are all part of the educational opportunities for comprehensive street learnings at this program, as well as some of the opportunities that we'll be providing our, our listeners with as we go forward. For those of you that want to contact me directly, both my email address as well as my cell phone number, I encourage you, if you do have inf uh, information that you're seeking after this particular session or sometime down the road after doing some readings and so forth, uh, feel free to reach out to me via email or give me a, a phone call and we'll do our best to get some information out to you regarding some, some references, research. Uh, we have our reading list that we make available on some case studies and IASH reports, as well as some reading lists that uh, we'll actually talk a little bit about toward the end of the session on what you should be reading. Again, I cannot stress the importance of what building construction is in today's fire ground for both the practicing and emerging fire officers, the commanders that are out there, and certainly the firefighters that will one day become uh, company officers in that first step in the first line of supervision. You cannot know enough about your buildings. And unfortunately, through our travels around the country, we constantly, time and time again, the lack of knowledge, the lack of fundamentals on building construction as it relates to the buildings on fire that we respond and go into, again, which is part of our program here today. So please feel free to reach out to me. As part of our program here, when we talk about the uh, Maryland State Firefighters, uh, Firemen's Association's virtual program, again, this is an unabridged program that will provide some general overview and some key insights regarding reading the building and the modeling of what we call building facts, first arriving, construction, tactics, and safety. And again, trying to take, uh, 40 plus years of, uh, of street smarts and education and, and experience, both from my standpoint, as well as a number of our other brother uh, colleagues that are out there, brothers and sisters, that again, have collaborated in on some of these concepts. Again, this program was edited accordingly for the uh, uh, virtual program uh, conference and delivery. We certainly do hope to be able to present this in person, uh, hopefully in 2021 to provide some face-to-face -face time with both the concepts, methodologies, as well as being able to have that uh, continuity with uh, an exchange, which is so important with our audience as part of the conversation at the kitchen table. We're going to be integrating some different elements here on size up risk, building construction, some profiling, predictability, some elements dealing with first arriving facts, and that's part of the uh, acronym of building facts. First arriving, construction, tactics, and safety. We start taking a look at that, that particular element regarding our first due and certainly within the first 10 to 15 minutes, 20 minutes of fire ground operation, it has part of the major elements here of, uh, of what it means back into reading the building, uh, both in terms of the concepts of bear, talk about building era, building anatomy and risk factors, talk about operations, some tactical challenges, talk about tactical profiling and some of the tactical windows, uh, we'll talk about uh, condition tactical response and again some elements here with size up discussions and our size up reads and again lacking any type of direct uh, engagement and conversation we'll just go through and present some of that slide information to give you some of those insights and hopefully give you time for the pause to see it to time to digest this information first and foremost see how it relates to your current level of knowledge and experience what your learnings are from your own organization at the county, at the departmental level, and the more importantly, at the individual level. How does this relate to your level of knowledge, skills, and abilities? What are the gaps? What are the areas that you need to uh, possibly identify to further your insights on information and knowledge to help you become both a more effective and efficient member of your team, an efficient member of your company, more importantly, part of that overall response on today's fire ground. Program resources, do we have a number of resources for those of you that are interested in building fact sheets, building uh, our reading the building operational aids, uh, buildings on fire facts and flow charts that are part of the uh, emerging uh, research and information that's out there This is that this is part of our tactical edge considerations and again, some tactical operational factors dealing with today's buildings. Again, a lot that we're gonna try to tie into the, the brief timeframe that we have available to us but again, part of the emerging elements of what we call reading the building and building facts that we've been doing for well over 10 years now. Uh, we were the first to uh, lay out the concepts of building era and vintage that have become somewhat institutionalized with a couple of different uh, 
writings and so forth that are out there. Again, we conceptualized these concepts uh, well over 10 plus years ago and continue to refine them as we go forward. Those of you that are interested, again, just a little side note, we do have a, a Buildings on Fire coin, challenge coin, so if you're interested in it, just uh, send us a quick email and we'll provide you with some insights on that, but that's a quick uh, little snapshot of that, uh, of that uh, coin down at the bottom. So again, let's get into our conversation here, some operational challenges. Again, we talk about today's fire, the fire grounds that we have, fire grounds of the past are certainly much different than today's fire ground. We talk about fires in our various types of occupancies. We talk about occupancy type and occupancy risk associated with these particular uh, buildings and types of fires. Fundamentally, it all goes back to building construction, building anatomy, understanding how these buildings are constructed, which eventually when they do become involved in some degree of fire, which results in our response, ultimately it falls on our shoulders of the company and the personnel to be able to engage and move into the types of conditions that we encounter at the first due level and ultimately as that incident evolves into something uh, far beyond the first due and that initial response, how that relates to our operations. Today's buildings and occupancies present increasing challenges that have redefined strategic and tactical fire ground operations and have changed the rules of engagement in structural firefighting and incidences. And again, you know, just going out to a, a bread and butter residential fire is far more than that, depending upon the size and the magnitude and the severity of the fire. We've gone well beyond just that standard 15,000, 1,500 to 2,000 square foot the residential. For many of our listeners, again, you've got 20, 30, 40,000 square foot single family residential fires that you are responding to. These, these mega mansions that again have significant challenges. It's much more than just a residential fire. It's much more than just a commercial fire in many instances when we respond out and operate. So again, if, 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 if in fact these have become challenges and changes, you know, what are some of the challenges that are out there? And they're numerous. Many of you have, have encountered them to a great degree and some of you have yet to encounter what they very well may be. But again, today's fire ground is certainly dramatically different than the fire ground of 10 years ago, or certainly for many of us, the last 20 years. From 2000 here, we're in 2020. Just the last 20 years have presented significant changes on a, on a dynamic fire ground that is far different than the 1990s or 80s or the 70s. And for some of us that uh, cut our teeth uh, in the early days of the 1970s and mid 70s, riding back step through the war years of the 70s, late 70s and early 80s, we understand and can recognize what those changes are. They are dramatic and certainly not subtle, but the subtle changes over the last 10 to 15 years are the things that our program um, is attempting to connect the dots on to present. Those challenges again today, uh, as we wait and anticipate those alarms to, to come in, when we do get out in the streets and we respond again, do we have building intel? Do we have pre-incident information, pre-fire information that again is gonna help us regarding the building, the building risk, the occupancy risk upon those buildings that we eventually do respond and arrive on scene. The dynamics of what we might be involved with, the fire conditions, the adequacy of resources in terms of, of both personnel, as well as the resources of the machines that are on the streets that are responding and give us the ability to operate on the fire ground. When we take a look at all of the dynamics of today's fire ground, the fire conditions that are again um, challenging at, a, at best and certainly have provided the, uh, the basis for much of what the research and the development of, of the studies that are coming out. They're giving us insights on the dynamics of a changing set of parameters in the buildings within the confines of the compartments that we're operating in and certainly the composition of our personnel is changing. Uh, whether we have enough or too few of personnel. And again, uh, when we're hitting the streets and we're responding with a, a two-person uh, complement, a three-person staff to company four, or have the luxury of responding out with more than that. That is certainly not the case in, in many of our jurisdictions around the country. And that has a direct correlation on how we engage in what we do. But upon arrival, again, the importance of looking at the fire dynamics within the building. We're gonna talk about three distinctive elements here today. We're gonna to talk about the building, we'll talk about the compartment, talk about the company. First and foremost, on our fire ground today, in this era, again, those three critical elements really form the foundation of everything we do. Building, compartment, and company. We'll talk more about that as we continue in. 
again, our, our anticipation upon arrival, the bigger the better, right? Sometimes the bigger the better may challenge us, but again, we've got to uh, sometimes be uh, aware of what we, uh, what we wish for. But again, are we prepared? Do we understand the predictability of performance within our buildings in the various occupancies? And this goes well beyond the five fundamental building types and it goes well beyond the fundamentals of occupancies. When we talk about a residential or commercial or retail or business or manufacturing and so forth, there are, biz, uh, there are occupancy risks associated with the fundamentals of building types that we'll talk about here today that has to be considered in the tactical incident action plan, have to be part of the tactical edge and have to be part of the deployment modeling when we operate on the fire ground. Again, for many of us, uh, again, all we wanna do is stretch the line and go in. For many of us, the fundamentals is just an aggressive posture and approach, hopefully with a, with a set of knowledge and insights to undertake what we need to do effectively as part of a coordinated ensemble of companies. But again, do we have weak links in there? We understand what the needs are, the time compression, the need, and the need really to act in a manner that uh, is not reckless, but is focused, is deliberate, and is reflected on upon our training, knowledge, and experience and our fortitude to undertake what is necessary to protect the public that may be in distress or may have uh, situations that really demand us to intervene within that structure, within that compartment, within a building that is being distressed each and every second while fire is affecting the compartment, the building's anatomy, its structural systems, the materials that may be present while we engage uh, within that particular structure. Building knowledge equates to that tactical edge. We have to have that knowledge of the building's anatomy. Again, I would challenge for many of you, do you have that level of knowledge that is necessary to be able to undertake what is needed on today's fire ground? We talk about fire ground operations and, uh, and conditions when we are engaging in those related uh, fire ground factors. Building anatomy, we got a variety of different eras and vintage of construction, materials, and so forth. We'll talk about how to put that together here in a, in a more conducive manner here. When we size up our buildings, again, we have various types of structures. We talk a lot over the last uh, 20 years about uh, the, the 360. Again, that was something that was born out of the late 1990s, refined in the early 2000s, and again, is fundamentally institutionalized in much of what we do here today. But do we have the level of knowledge to truly understand how to read the building? Do we understand the fundamentals of size up as it relates to fire ground operations? And sometimes we may be looking and we may be seeing, but the challenge is that you're not comprehending what it is that you're seeing. Do you have the ability to uh, <clears throat> be able to correlate between what it is that you're observing, understand the importance and be able to identify those factors of what it is in that building's perimeter, the roof conditions, the fire conditions that are there. Do you have the ability to comprehend what it is that you're seeing and then be able to communicate that in a manner that is clear and is understood by those that are listening to your communications? And unfortunately, time and time again, we see some errors and omissions in what's being uh, uh, communicated or the attempts toward communications are lacking because the individuals, um, are struggling with trying to comprehend what it is that they saw and how to put those into concise words uh, that are accurate and that, uh, again, uh, are understood by commanders or company officers that uh, we're trying to share that in information with. Again, when we talk about fire ground operations, again, we talk about the various aspects. And these have a, a factor on how we read the building, <clears throat> what stages of fire we're at, on arrival, but again, fire ground operations, both the rural, the suburban conditions, and certainly our urbanized areas, all have significant differences that are part of the building's read, part of the tactical operational aspects on today's fire ground. And even when we talk about uh, what side of the curve are you responding to, sometimes, uh, again, that will have a significant influence on what we are doing. Again, when we talk about uh, growth factors and uh, fire dynamics, much more than just uh, talking about um, some of the aspects of fire science. Again, we used to talk a little bit about uh, fire dynamics in a very limited condition in, in previous uh, fire classes and so forth, but now fire dynamics and the whole aspects of fire engineering, 
growth aspects of the fire load package, all of these things play out significantly. But again, the question is on what side of the curve are you arriving on? Is it a pre-flash over? Are you arriving on the bubble just prior to or during the stages of flashover? Or are we in the post-flashover stage? These all have, again, contributors toward how we engage, how we interface with the building, and how we operate on the fire ground. There are serious implications and considerations. There are varying levels of risk and tactical engagement factors that all have to be accounted for as part of that first do. First do, again, construction, tactics, and safety, and how they influence our overall operations. Can't say enough, again, don't engage like you've got a, a five-staff company when you've only got three. Again, there's gonna be limitations on what you can do, some of the factors, efficiency factors, and so forth. Take a look at some of the empirical uh, staffing and operational capabilities that have come out of some of the studies through NIST in particular, 25 to 30% uh, reduction. Again, we talk about uh, going from two to three, or again, uh, conditions of three to five person staffing. Again, they're going to be increasing or decreasing uh, levels of efficiencies or deficiencies as one promotes. Sometimes the strategic incident and action plan very well may be just, again, working uh, um, in a different capacity. Again, what are the go, no-go trigger points? Are we assessing and reading building integrity, building anatomy? Are we taking a look at the hostile environment? Are we taking a look at both the factors of compromise and collapse within the building, what may potentially be failing as we are stretching the line, working within the confines of the structure and within the compartment, what's the integrity of the floor, what's the integrity of the ceiling, what's the integrity of the compartments above us, what's the integrity of the roof system, perimeter walls, these are all part of those aspects. Even the compartment itself, what is the integrity factors of potential compromise and collapse, take a look at the uh, compartment in itself, it's reading the conditions both within as well as outside of the, of the building at any given time. And it is much more than stretching the line and going in. We we'll take a look at, again, arriving on scene and going into an operational mode. Who's responsible for size up? That size up, again, we can talk about uh, old school size up considerations, and we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a few moments. But again, all of this, it's much more than stretching the line going in. Yes, it's imperative that we have a high degree of efficiency in stretching that line getting across that threshold and engaging within the confines of the building within that compartment. But the effectiveness or the loss of capability of doing that, along with, again, not taking the time, those, those brief seconds to assess that building, provide a quick assessment and size up, understanding key parameters, they will make all the difference sometimes between uh, life and death, guys. It's, it's as simple as that, and it is much more than stretching the line and going in. Talk about the first do and the complexities and the demands, uh, how quickly today's fire will escalate from a room and contents, which is pretty much bread and butter operations in the 70s, 80s, certainly all the way up through the 90s. Fires today in, in our compartments based upon those fire load packages, the rate of heat release and the, and the severity and the magnitude of how quickly fire will elevate and escalate from a room and contents into a structural fire affecting structural elements, either individual components, assemblies, or systems. And sometimes it does not take much to suddenly cause that imbalance on structural integrity of that building to suddenly go on the uh, negative side that will adversely affect us uh, within those brief ensuing couple of seconds or minutes while we're operating within that structure. Again, for many of us that watched uh, the uh, circumstances arise, let me, let me just lock this in for a quick second here. Talk about a, uh, an ensuing fire and how that fire quickly escalated within the first uh, few minutes. We take a look at operating companies in uh, Los Angeles. Um, commercial fire, again, not a large footprint of a building, uh, rather deep in terms of depth, rather narrow in terms of its construction and materials. But again, the fire load and the dynamics, when we talk about the hostile environment and the conditions affecting the companies, both interior, on the roof, and the fact of our brothers who were uh, uh, involved, both uh, in terms of the fire intensity and the severity of those conditions uh, as they were trying, trying to come off that roof and the conditions within that compartment within such a brief period of time. So again, a lot of lessons that are gonna come, come out of that and uh, the learnings and so forth, but we can't stress enough how, about how quickly things can go from being 
having the appearance of being another bread and butter achievable operation to something that can go uh, devastatingly wrong in the blink of an eye. Things that will challenge all of our companies in a manner that, uh, again, are, are unexpected. And this is where, again, we've got to take a look at a variety of factors to give us that tactical edge to try to uh, decrease the level of risk and still allow us to conduct our operations in and around that building and its risk and the occupancy factors that are affecting that building each and every time we operate and conduct our, our conditions and operations. There are relationships when we talk about structural firefighting based upon research insights, NIOSH learnings, information from the National Fall and Firefighters Foundation, U.S. Fire Administration, NFPA, UL, NIST, and, and so forth. Those insights, again, are, are part of what we're talking about here in this session, trying to connect those dots, the fundamentals of our operating domains, again, buildings on fire, learnings that, again, are driven by 70 and 80 years of methodologies and practice that have always been proven, time-proven methodologies that, again, we're trying to increase and give us that tactical edge, connect some of the dots that, that research is giving us that's screaming at us in terms of the fire load packages and performances, and well as, again, just trying to look at the building differently with a level of knowledge that is born out of that building's anatomy, building construction, aspects of the compartment, as well as capabilities or limitations from a company level. These are all part of the building facts model and, again, are all born out of the parameters of, of what research is giving us. When we take a look at the old time temperature curve, some of the parameters dealing with uh, both the insights of what research, not only in terms of what UL and NIST has been doing over the last 10 years, but research that's been out there for the last 40 and 50 years that, unfortunately, the fire service, aside from those of us that, in, that have been involved in the uh, fire protection engineering side or the architectural side, just have failed to recognize. So much of the learnings that are coming out are new to, to a great extent based upon today's parameters of the testing parameters of what the basis is of that research. But again, we have just not kept up with what research has time and time again given us on the engineering side. But now we do have aspects and we can put uh, a term and we can put connotations back to phenomena on today's fire ground. We talk about the phenomena of uh, changes within the compartment, changes, changes to the building. Now we talk about limit, uh, limited uh, uh, relationships of ventilation, limited uh, conditions. We talk about flow paths, vent paths. These are all part of understanding the compartment that are part of understanding the building. It's part of understanding today's fire ground and operations. All of the field testing research and insights are all data points. We see the changes that are coming about through both uh, NFPA 1700, the up and coming standard fire flow rates of NFPA 1710, uh, the movement away of, of sustainable gallon per minute uh, flow rates from 300 to 500. And again, a whole variety of different elements that are part of today's fire ground, today's compartment, and the need to come up with different parameters of reading the building, assessing, and putting that into place in terms of our operations. A lot of what we talk about here in this session, again, is, is based upon a whole new set of parameters of looking at today's buildings, today and all of our buildings. It's not just today's construction and today's fire ground. Taking a look at fires within the various types of age and era and vintage of buildings, truly understanding the aspects of construction, anatomy features, the inherent, the predictability of construction, and relating that back to fire within the compartment, how that fire will travel within the building, and how ultimately that building's anatomy, the construction, the materials that are being utilized, the inherent compromise and collapse considerations, how the various types of materials within that building, along with the fire dynamics, along with the aspects of occupancy risk, how they play out when we arrive on scene and go into operations. We really need to have a fundamental understanding and then even to the greater extent, an advanced level of knowledge, skills, abilities of understanding the building's anatomy, construction systems, and how that plays out within our structures how that relates back to the conditions that we have the opportunity to see each and every day during the construction phases that again are gonna be challenging at best when the buildings are completely uh, finished off and enclosed in, and again, are eventually furnished and occupied within the buildings. 
some of these fundamentals of reading the building include the acronym of BEAR. That ac acronym includes, again, building, predictability, performance considerations, the era and vintage, various types of decades of time in which a building was built, was built in the 70s or 80s or the 80s through the 90s, buildings of the 1940s or 20s and 1910s, and the, the buildings of, of type three construction in a different era in the 1800s. These are all definable by an era or period that vintage also has considerations based upon the predictability of performance. Again, these are all things that one can learn, gain some insights that will be part of developing some insights on the building's anatomy, structural systems, and that also extend back into building risk, occupancy type, and occupancy risk. These are all part of the aspects of building facts, first arriving construction tactics and safety. Some of the mission critical reads when we talk about assessing today's fire ground and assessing a building on fire includes aspects of the roof, perimeter walls, aspects of the floor, understanding the compartment, and recognizing and trying to identify how voids will play out uh, either negatively or maybe to a great extent in a very detrimental way uh, within the structure. So again, when we take a look at fundamentally, the five critical elements of the building and the building read, aside from the fire conditions, again, roof, perimeter wall, floors, the compartment, and the voids that are present within the building. We'll talk more about these things. Again, condition tactical reflexes, it's how we've conditioned ourselves to typically react upon arrival to both fire conditions and building conditions. Again, if it's a residential occupancy, we have conditions, our, conditions ourselves to operate and really reflex and go into a mode of operation very quickly, but sometimes that condition tactical reflex really requires us to have a pause and to take a look at how we are going to operate and go into an operational mode on today's fire ground. Again, that includes resources. It includes a staffing uh, applications command, conventional tactics that are normally uh, implemented very efficiently based upon much of what we have uh, read. Uh, our learnings, it's part of our training applications and so forth, conventional tactics for that conventional type of occupancy that have all proven to be successful in the past. We go into an operational mode, and again, we expect a certain level of time to uh, be present to allow us to operate within that capacity. And again, we're expecting the rules of engagement to be in place. We're expecting certain outcomes of that fire to occur that uh, are going to allow us, number one, that we're gonna have enough time to engage and operate. We're gonna have enough time to control and suppress that fire to be able to mitigate it. That we'll have enough time to uh, be able to identify and locate civilians that are in distress and be able to evacuate them uh, successfully out of that structure. That we ourselves will have enough time to execute the mission to be able to do what we need to do. But unfortunately, that very well may not be the case. Again, we see a compression of time. We see how that compression of time and fire dynamics affecting the building. And again, these other elements in terms of command, staffing, and resources, that sometimes when that disconnect occurs, those dominoes start falling in a, in a very uh, detrimental way. When we take a look at the occupancy risk factors and not occupancy type, again, we start seeing some of the implications based upon resource, based upon staffing, based upon command decision-making and operations. We see an evolving nature of tactics. We see an evolving nature of operations, a diminishing window of opportunity for tactical deployment, and that tactical window becomes smaller and smaller. We'll talk about how that tactical window back in the day used to be 20 minutes, but again, it's compressed down to a tactical window, window more often than not. It's a 10-minute window that, again, we've got to be monitoring and reading uh, both at the company and at the command level during the conduct of our operations that ultimately uh, give us an adaptive fire ground management model. It drives us to a much more adaptive approach at buildings that conventionally may very well be bread and butter operations but demand of us to have a more adaptive approach based on what we have for resources, what the staffing composition level may be. Do we have experienced individuals? Do we have a composition of both experienced and inexperienced individuals? What kind of command capabilities do we have or limitations? How effective are the tactics that we're deploying? Are we monitoring that clock? And are we becoming more resilient and adaptive to the changing conditions relative to time of operations 
that demand of us to have a more adaptive approach for our operations. More often than not, we are underestimating and we're disengaged. We don't understand fire behavior on the structure, structural uh, compromise and the aspect of both the structure and the compartment stability. So again, there's the aspects of monitoring and reading those conditions relative to the integrity of the structure as well as the integrity of the compartment. The need and immediacy for actions cannot be understated. There is a need in today's fire ground to have immediacy of actions that sometimes will make the difference of a lot. And I can say again, we're talking about interior, exterior operations, survivability of, of, uh, of the occupants that may be in distress or may be trapped. But again, that all goes back to skill set level. The knowledge, skills, and abilities of our companies and the actions upon arrival, there is a need for the immediacy of decisive and effective actions on today's fire ground, which leads us down to a whole different level of training and some other insights from that standpoint. Need for effectiveness of action. So yeah, you may be very immediate in your actions, but the other question may be, how effective are you in those actions and in the deployment of operations? There needs to be a, a fluid level of assessment, monitoring both the building, the compartment, and the company. So it goes back to that fundamental block of building, compartment, and company and the fluid assessment. So we talk about first two size up, we talk about the first two size up relative to the 360, but we need to be monitoring and assessing that building's conditions all throughout that operation and, in, and continuing right through, uh, uh, through the overall stages until we pick up and actually uh, return back to quarters. Impact on the occupants, and again, the predictability of building performance. These are things well beyond our, our program here today but predictability of building performance are things that we can learn about our buildings based upon the era and vintage in which they were built, based upon the building's anatomy, it goes back to the acronym of BEAR, understanding the building, era, vintage, understanding the anatomy, and then understanding the risk that goes back to predictability of building performance, and then more importantly, understanding time, task, the intervention, and ultimately the control factors of, of that operation. We talk about adaptive fire ground management. These are mission critical engagement factors, the immediacy and robust level of resource. You've got to have companies available on scene within the earliest stages as possible. We're seeing delayed responses and alarms, unfortunately, due to other related factors and uh, box alarm reductions, uh, putting less uh, vehicles on the road and so forth. Those are having uh, an impact on what we may want to do versus what we would like to do versus what we can do. Uh, during the earliest stages of time because we don't have enough personnel, we don't have enough resources for immediate engagement. So therefore, we, we start getting engaged with a lessening degree of personnel, a lessening degree of gallon per minute sustainable flow rates. So again, we talk about immediacy of having those resources and having a robust level of resources during our, our operations. Effective and proficient staffing, Concurrent tactical engagement, again, in which we've got to be engaging on a number of different fronts during the conduct of our operation. Having tactical mobility, command depth and resiliency, and again, the time management portion of that, adaptive fire ground management considerations and modeling, along with pre-fire building intel. I cannot stress enough about having building intelligence information from a pre-planning standpoint in advance of our arrival, or hopefully having that building intel available to us while we're during, uh, during the immediate uh, stages of our operations. Take a look at fire dynamics. We take a look at some of the aspects, just talking about large area mega mansions, just as an example here. Talk about building footprints and the square footages. Again, it's much more than just square footages, it's building volume that we've got to consider, understanding the building's anatomy, the structural features of that building, and the layout of the building. So again, we talk about the layout, relative to the footprint. We take a look at the square footages and the volumes of that building relative to the building's anatomy and its vintage, the building's siting relative to its topography and the kinds of conditions that we may find within the uh, confines of that building and building lot, along with the exposures and other factors and conditions. Then we start considering and sizing up and adding the aspects of the fire within the compartment, fire within the structure, and then again, the other aspects when we talk about building, talk about compartment, and then the aspects of the company. Again, staffing levels, capability levels, these are all part of the size up considerations. You can now see this is much more than 
time of day, response, building location, address, what kind of fire do I have, and we go, go to work. Again, a lot of old school aspects of size up that no longer are valid or applicable on today's fire ground. Again, what part of the curve are we on and how do we have optimization, do we have limitations right at the get-go, coupled with that fire and those relationships back to these three aspects here. Then we take a look at initial uh, response and operations, gallon per minute, sustainability, and flow paths and so forth. Flow paths relative to fire within the compartment, as well as fire dynamics relative to flow paths, vent paths during we have during tactical engagement of that building. What is the severity, the urgency, and the growth potential of fire within those compartments within that building? So again, it's severity, urgency, and growth that equate back to risk. And we'll talk more about that risk factor. That plays into the fire dynamics in terms of tactical windows and ultimately may lead into other critical uh, aspects, such as we're showing here, critical flow, uh, flow rate, sustainability, gallon per minute. So it's about square footage. When we take a look at our buildings, we are going to be considering and trying to identify what is the square footage and the volume. Some of these are very naturally things that we have developed over our experience levels. Again, if we talk about a small uh, 1,200 or 1,000 square foot uh, Cape Cod or uh, bungalow type structure built in a certain era and vintage of the late 50s, early 60s, has a certain type of construction, certain type of anatomy. Again, we can also correlate what the square footages of that building are, the degree of compartmentation, the kinds of volumes that are there, the type of construction, how the deployment, tactical mobility may either help or deter us, staffing and resources, and how that comes together when we're talking about levels of risk or size up and going to work. Sometimes those less complex factors allow us to stretch the line and go in. That is what we've developed over certainly the last decades of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and well into the 2000s. It's fundamentally how much of our tactical books have been written, those books again from the 70s and 80s. But again, it's going well beyond that due to the fire dynamics and the dynamic nature of today's fire ground. When we take a look at performance and operational factors, time aspects of today's fire ground regarding tactical windows, condition tactical response, and some of the edge aspects that we're going to get into, the severity, urgency, and growth, correlating that back to a level of risk, tying that back into building anatomy, era and vintage, severity and growth, and the concept of writ that we'll throw into here at this point in time. When we talk about writ, it's really not talking about it in terms of the conventional aspects of what, when, when we talk about writ from a uh, firefighter in distress standpoint. But the concept of writ, all fundamental goes back to the building and the information that we've presented thus far. We're gonna introduce this concept of RIT relative to resiliency, integrity, and time relative to performance during fireground operations. So when we take a look at these particular aspects, it's going to include building performance as part of our size up to try to identify what is the resiliency or the resistance that that building may have regarding its compartment, or the integrity factors of fire within the compartment or fire within the compartment or within the structure itself. So if I have a fire within the confines of the compartment or fire that has now extended into the aspect of the voids within the building, how will that relate back into the integrity of that building, the integrity of the compartment, the integrity of the floor, integrity of the ceiling, the integrity of the building envelope, roof, perimeter walls, as we talked about earlier, and how will that relate back to a given perspective or understanding of time? So when we start sizing up our buildings relative to today's fire dynamics regarding condition tactical response, severity, urgency, and growth, it all goes back to what is the severity of the conditions, what is our urgency of operations, and what is the growth potential over a period of time? Resiliency and integrity over time of what we're going to do regarding the building's integrity during the conduct of operations, whether they be in or around the building. These are all part of the developing buildings on fire facts uh, modeling. Performance factors, when we talk about operations, when we put those in play, 
some of those, again, may relate back to are we in an urbanized or suburban type setting? What are the density factors? What is the type of siting considerations versus going into the outer rings of both the outer suburbia or things that may be out in the rural type settings? For many of us, again, we may have upwards of 15 or 20,000 square foot single family residentials that are out in a rural type of setting that have a much greater degree of a both footprint as well as a diminishing degree of exposure concerns. But again, now we talk about response factors of getting from our quarters, from, from our uh, fire station locations to those areas. Do we have sustainability of water? There are a lot of other factors that are gonna come into play that are gonna affect our operations. Primary tenets of our operations, again, resiliency, integrity, and time. We've introduced this concept. Again, that time factor is all gonna be part of our size of consideration. The predictability, the probability performance, compromise and collapse, fire dynamics that are gonna be part of our condition, tactical reflex, severity, urgency, and growth, that whole acronym of SUG. Again, this is gonna be very critical when we talk about buildings on fire, predictability, and part of the ensuing aspect of size up. Also the aspect of human performance, high risk, high consequences, or again, high risk, low uh, consequences, and so forth. Those are part of the fundamentals of the risk matrix uh, ensemble. Again, how all of these play out to adapt to fire ground management. When we take a look at these risk considerations, again, something uh, as simple as residential. Residential types are single family residentials, large area residentials, primarily those in the six to 10,000 square foot, or for many of us, we know we've, we've heard the term before, McMansions, and again, the McMansions, all the way up to the mega mansions. Again, all of these are things that change the level of risk of a residential structure. Single family residential, 900 square feet, upwards of 20 or 30 or 40,000 square feet. Physical locations and siting, the vintage, the era, uh, building anatomy are the you know, items of information that we presented. Size and layout, again, as well as the configuration. It's square foot along with cubic feet. It's the volume of the structure, that are all gonna be part of understanding what do we have relative to that floor and the compartment configurations. Again, for many of our residentials of newer construction, we have sizable areas that may be upwards of two or 3,000 square feet of interconnected space. Now we take a look at connectivity and trying to size up even upon entry into the vestibule. We've done our 360 outside, we've gotta be sizing up that building in terms of the compartments, what's connected both horizontally and vertically in those spaces. How does that square footage, how's that volume, how will that play out relative to integrity of the building, the area that we're operating, and more importantly, suppression capabilities in terms of sustainable gallon per minute flow rates and either operating above, underneath, or on those locations. The fire extent, the severity, the urgency, and the growth factors, civilians at risk and priorities. And then again, always putting that back into the one fundamental commodity part of our size up and part of that risk assessment is the aspect of time. We've got to be monitoring the time in a particular tactical window, which for many of us, some of us are operating in the appropriate tactical windows for many of us, uh, based upon what we've identified through our travels around the country, that time window is still antiquated in, in many of our jurisdictions around the country. And some of you may be operating in a tactical window that still uses old school 20 minute uh, fire ground rules, or maybe you've diminished it back to that 15 minute window. But again, we'll talk about the importance of, of that 10 minute window of uh, operations and that fluid size up and how that's part of the continuing aspects of size up and monitoring the fire ground in 10 minute increments on the, on the fire uh, scene. And then also the aspects of resources and ultimately, the, uh, the availability of sustainable delivery gallon per minute flow rates of water. These are all part of the ensuing aspects when we talk about gaining that tactile edge and part of our condition tactical response. So RPDM, recognition prime decision making, again, naturalistic decision making is what it's revol revolved into. We talk about including our levels of experience, however extent or limiting they may be, experiences of the past as well as the experiences of today having a, a continuing fluid level of awareness or increasing that awareness based upon what we're getting from information, both kitchen table discussions as well as feedback information 
and awareness through online uh, applications of knowledge, going through our conferences, and again, looking at experience, what we're gaining in the streets, along with an increased awareness, just for very similarly as to what we're getting from this particular class. So it's combining recognition decision-making processes, naturalistic elements that are coming from the streets. It's our experiences as well as virtual experiences, increasing our wellness coupled with our knowledge base. What is the knowledge, skills, and abilities? How are we increasing that? How are we gaining that through these other elements? As well as throwing in the science, the technology, and information that's coming out of R&D. It's taking all of those elements and putting it and combining it. So these have a relevancy to our buildings, our fires, and the company. Experience, awareness, and knowledge. The insights we're getting out of science and technology, the R&D, the, the data that's coming out of our studies, both from various types of reports, after action reports, the R&D coming out of NIST and UL, that all is giving us the need to look at a much more adaptive level of fire ground. We combine that, that is what's going to give us a conditioned tactical response and reflex and a tactical edge on today's fire ground. We take a look at the evolving nature of square foot and volume. Again, it's, it's a simple graphic, but sometimes we need that simplicity to uh, focus in on it. Again, small to large, when we take a look at the increasing square footages and volume sizes and the kinds of fire conditions, the increasing levels of risk, it's a no-brainer, but again, we are not correlating that when we take a look at size up and occupancy risk when we talk about fire and the severity, talk about levels of heat release, the megawatts of energy, the intensity levels. These are all tying and connecting back to the dots of what, again, UL and NIST studies are talking about regarding the fire load packages. And now we're correlating that information, connecting that dot into a couple of other areas relative to the bare, the building era, vintage risk levels, building anatomy, and fundamentally just talking about how fires are affecting our buildings, which ultimately requires to have a whole different set of parameters on sizing up our structures upon arrival. When we take a look at that structure, take a look at fire conditions, it's a residential structure. We can see the severity and the magnitude of that fire, but do we correlate that back to performance of the building? And how does that play into what type of tactical reflexes will we ensue? What type of tactical deployments and coupled with the capabilities or limitations? So the plus is we may have a very effective capability of our company to engage and do what's necessary under the least amount of time in a highly effective manner, or we may be, again, placing our personnel in a very high risk prone environment, hoping that the outcome is gonna be positive. But again, if there's diminished capabilities on the company, we don't recognize and are able to project and predict how that fire will travel within the building, affect the integrity of various aspects of that building, understand and be able to predict and have a level of predictability of the voids, the potential level of compromise and collapse and correlate that to the tactical window. How much time do I have to do what's necessary, whether it be to do a primary search, do a vent enter, whether you isolate or do your search, trying to control the environment, control the compartment. Sometimes, again, that initial fire attack line, guys, may not be in a suppression mode. It may be there in a defensive mode to support the uh, search and rescue mission. Again, understanding that the fire intensity and the degree of involvement within that structure is well beyond the capabilities of that first, second, or third line going in, depending upon where that building's located, the sustainability of gallon per minute flow rates. If you only got one line flowing, again, it may the whole emphasis there may be to support the mission of taking a look at the occupancy and risk, trying to identify and search for any civilians in distress that re may require uh, removal out of that structure. Operational risks include entrapment, air supply management, exposure to fire products, again, very rapid uh, uh, fire behavior, compromise and collapse, as we've talked about, and those particular aspects that come together. So. Again, depending upon the size, and this is going to be true for residential and the small footprint, the commercial buildings, or that large footprint mega mansion uh, that has all of the same characteristics as a commercial building, but it's a residential occupancy. Again, era and vintage, we take a look at tactical windows. 
we just take a look at some of those factors in terms of construction and features. Do we have operational times? Again, limitations and so forth. Can we size up the buildings? Are, are they the same type of construction, same tactics? Which one has conventional? Which one has engineered construction? Same level of risk, same risk management, same tactics, same operations? The answer very well may be no. Again, do we have that same level of aggressive firefighting that may be implemented to, to operate within that particular structure? Take a look at building considerations. Again, building construction is as fundamental to structural firefighting as water is to fire suppression. Can't say it any simpler than that, but building construction is as fundamental to structural firefighting as water is to fire suppression. If we don't get that, then everything else that we're talking about, again, is gonna fall on, on, on uh, uneducated ears or fall on deaf ears. When we take a look at understanding construction, being as fundamental to the firefighting realm as water is to fire suppression. If we can make that clear distinction and connection, you will be so far on the way. But at the same time, let's not get so hung up on other types of protocols and all of these other aspects. And again, we can provide some avenues of considerations and modeling and even the acronyms provide us with a methodology and a practice to memorize, to commit to some way of operating for us to reconsider, for us to be able to have recall. But at the end of the day, fundamentally, the most efficient way to control the environment is getting water on that fire. But again, we have to have an adaptive approach. Is it right or wrong? And we'll leave that for other points of discussion to uh, provide water from the outside to the interior, or must it always be from the interior uh, within the confines of being as close to that seat of the fire as possible. I'll leave that for other avenues and discussions and so forth. But again, in, in many instances, the building's risk, the building's predictability performance, and the other factors that we size up will sometimes drive the incident action plan and certainly influence, will influence the tactics that one might deploy for those operations. The building construction aspects, again, you've gotta be looking at your buildings each and every day. These buildings in many instances have been around for decades of time, but again, we don't, we don't see the forest from the trees. Our buildings have existed in many instances for decades upon decades of time. Those factors may not be recognizable and we in turn may not be considering them during the conduct of our operations. Understanding the building's performance, fire conditions, understanding the severity of the urgency and the growth, understanding the predictability of performance. Do we, do we understand perimeter aspects of perimeter walls? Do we have an appreciation for collapse zones, both internal and external? Do we have an appreciation for fire severity based upon fire going from a room and contents to a compartment, to a structure, to exposures? And again, sometimes that may make the difference between a room and contents to a structure fire, to a block fire, to a city fire, to a conflagration. Sometimes building features, again, if we're not aware of the little things, do we have a level of, of, uh, of appreciation of the fire ground, situational awareness, taking a look at the big picture, and again, having that relate back to our operations and conduct, building features, are we sizing up and understanding aspects of building components as part of systems, as part of assemblies in our various era and vintage of our construction. Or do we see fire, we give a quick size up, we utilize a very robotic and mechanized uh, approach, we read our particular index cards, we follow a very prescriptive type of size up profiling that uh, we've become very conditioned to, or are we utilizing critical thinking that again is related back to the conditions that one has upon your arrival at any given point in time of a fire. So yeah, you may have a fire on the top floor of a type three, but are you looking at other factors in that building? Are we recognizing other conditions that may certainly have influenced that building? Building collapse and compromise first and foremost. Again, when we talk about perimeter walls, so we've talked about roof, we talked about perimeter walls, there are characteristics associated with both subtle or very obvious factors based upon construction, age, and vintage of the buildings. Those will affect the integrity of operations from a compromise or catastrophic failure within the building. 
as well as the operations around the building's perimeter. So there are gonna be factors that are gonna be subtle, something of a leaser degree of nature. It might be a compromising limited condition or maybe a catastrophic large scale collapse. So compromise to collapse factors. Understanding the building's anatomy factors and conditions. And again, understanding what it is that goes into that building that we are reading upon our arrival. We fundamentally have to have a level of appreciation of that as well as the structural system, the degree of voids that are present. How will the integrity of what we are seeing uh, upon our arrival when the building has been completed in construction and is occupied, are we able to correlate what we see at street side to what goes on within the building's anatomy inside of that building? And do we have a level of appreciation? This is where, again, the need for a much greater degree of knowledge and skills are going to be uh, required and be in place. Understanding the aspects of uh, renovations and adaptive reuses, what may change? Again, all fundamentally goes in place during those opportunities that we may be missing. What is it that we're seeing in the streets each and every day as we're passing by to renovations and alterations or new construction? Or the things that may be going on right underneath our noses and many first dues that create the hybrid types of structures. No longer do we have a conventional type three, single or multiple occupancy type building, especially when we introduce new construction along with adaptive elements that went into the original buildings that suddenly change the parameters and how that building is going to operate. Do we even have any ability to insight and be able to take a look at this particular structure and try to read it? Or we may become very illiterate and become sometimes at a loss for words to try to even categorize and give a rundown of what we may be seeing in the streets upon our arrival. Sometimes those subtleties are, are fairly extensive over many, many generations of time. This particular building here that we see originally began as a four-story uh, type three, as you see here. Back in the 1940s, the top two floors of the structure were lost in a fire that again, uh, uh, lost the top two floors, those were all removed, and eventually in the 1960s, what would have been a building that looked like this was renovated to what we see here. But if subtly you take a look at a small little feature here, this aluminum fascia upon its removal actually has some very uh, telling insights into how that building is constructed. But one day at some point, either through our observations or unbeknownst to us, that building starts going through some renovations. That facade that we just saw is removed. Suddenly we see the original elements of that building as it truly existed. A building of type three construction along with cast iron uh, structural supports, both in terms of uh, beams and columns that are assembled in there. We very well may have seen some of those initial elements here through that slight element uh, of that building a moment ago but this building is going to undergo through significant uh, renovations and alterations over that period of time. Are these things that you see each and every day enough for you to stop in the streets to take a look at what's going on in that building? We suddenly see a second, a third, and a fourth floor added on, new construction along with all of the original construction, openings within masonry walls that are being modified, and very subtly over an extended number of weeks and months, we see the building really transform itself. Original cast iron with riveted construction at the base of this building that as it's covered over with the zip panels that make it start looking entirely different, can we have the ability to read that building without building intel that we should be monitoring each and every shift or every couple of days or on our own time or on shift time that suddenly changes the appearance of that building as well as how that building will perform under fire conditions. So this building here that now looks to be new construction adjacent to that original exposure that still has a, a party wall that is being shared on this particular division is, is transformed. So that building of type three construction, 1900s era on the first and second floor, renovated type three brick construction on the number one and number two floors and divisions 
in new engineered wood construction on the number three, number four divisions of those floors, along with an entirely different building perimeter, fascias that have been added into, and now you've arrived on scene, reading the building with a fire in any one of these compartments, and you're gonna read it wrong if you don't have that building intel and be, being out in the streets with your companies and capturing that information. Understanding the buildings as they exist each and every day will make all of the difference when you size up that structure and try to get into a mode of tactical operations. Again, going from this to this requires much more than just showing up and stretching that line. Do we have the ability to understand the uniqueness of buildings in terms of conditions over generations of time when we've got to go to work and again, commit personnel into these particular structures? Do we have an understanding around the buildings? So again, it may be the 180, maybe the 90. We may not have the ability to do a 360, but again, do we have an understanding of what is on the street side versus the alleyway side? What's on the number one division? What's on the number three division of that particular structure? And how will that relate back to your operational modes, tactics, and conditions? We have to first and foremost have an understanding of what it is that we're seeing relative to construction, building anatomy, in terms of how that building is constructed, the types of materials and the method in which those buildings were constructed going back to the era. So when they were built, what types of materials were being utilized, what types of methods of construction, coupled with how the buildings were being built, those go back to how fire and dynamics will affect that structure when they start off in a small compartment and start challenging the operations of that building during the conduct. And that, again, all of that comes back together. Size up may be cursory, meaning it may be very simplified. You will utilize that, that index card, five-step process that many of you utilize or have been utilizing. And again, is it utilizing critical thinking or are you just merely reciting some things that everyone is expecting you to recite, communicating or just giving miscommunications of, of information that's use, useless or useful. And again, it fundamentally goes back to construction, fire, and those conditions during the size up. More often than not, again, the size up factors and in taking into a consideration the uh, integrity of the building's perimeter. So it's integrity of the building compartment, it's the integrity of building uh, perimeter conditions. Normally the aspects include both floor and roofs that are going to affect perimeter walls. But even again, the types of materials that are being utilized, again, relative to fire ground perimeter operations around the fire ground, as well as interior operations in the conduct. Construction site fires, residential fires. Now we're just gonna talk about some of the related types of conditions, but all of these have significant parameters that one is going to size up and look at to gain that tactical edge. Considerations dealing with prefabrication, modular construction, multiple occupancy challenges, hybrids, the alterations, and, and new construction that may go into those buildings that are being renovated are all going to require very astute, and very insightful key elements. One of the challenges in sizing up today's buildings is that we recite the certain type of size up factors that we've all become very used to that many of our, of our uh, trade journals and uh, textbooks, again, old school, new school will, will program us into a way of thinking. Challenges are sometimes we, we have so much information overload that you may be looking at things that are innocuous and don't have an impact on the big picture of the operation. One of the clear uh, aspects of conditioning and developing a skill set for sizing up and reading the buildings is quickly being able to differentiate from the background noise. The kinds of things that are given within a particular building type that upon arrival, companies will understand what their meanings may be, even just understanding the building type and construction and so forth, but keying in on some key factors that are gonna be mission critical. So again, we sometimes have so much informational overload that again, we don't have the ability to focus in on critical elements. Do I have a crack in a, in a brick bearing wall that's going to make the difference of, again, building integrity while the companies are going in? Am I able to focus in on critical structural elements, building aspects, fire conditions that have the most amount of imperative 
communications that have the most amount of critical information relative to sizing up the building and how it relates to the conduct of our operations. Reutilization of our buildings again creates old buildings that look like new buildings or old buildings that still look old with a lot of different features on them. And anytime you show up on an older type of structure, this is mill construction. Again, you should be number one aware that the change in occupancies are, but this building in particular had laid vacant for numerous uh, decades of time. It's being renovated, sometimes just reading the building and the fact that we have new window treatments, new signages, new occupancy aspects, sometimes that may be enough to trigger uh, an understanding that the building's been modified and changed. But again, when we take a look at the interior of that building, you still may have new and old, which again, they can give you different operational times. Anytime you find a dumpster in front of one of your buildings, again, and you're in the streets, stop that company, take a quick look and see what's there. Just the fact that these older buildings have had their soft first floors modified over periods of time. These obviously weren't the original construction features or the appearance or the design or the aesthetics or architecture of them. They were mod modified at some period of time in the past, which again creates a whole series of questions about facade integrity, as well as the amount of concealed spaces that may be pre uh, present there. These again are factors that should be known. Upon arrival, all companies should be able to distinguish that that first floor has been modified accordingly, an entry point. Again, there's things that are gonna be present there that are gonna influence my operation all the way from the cornices to the type of construction. And again, more often than not, you may find the, the age of that building being right either at a cor cornerstone uh, that's new or old in one of the uh, cornices or certainly one of the capstones that's gonna clearly say built in 1885 or 1910 and what have you. These are all gonna be critical to your sizing up. But again, when we take a look at features inside of the building, that's why the size up is continuous. You're gonna be opening up areas and identifying hopefully characteristics and communicating that aspect of new and old construction being part of a mill building that are gonna react differently during the conduct of our operations and size up. Sometimes those challenges of what's behind the curtain are gonna be very telling. When this particular occupancy is finished off, are we gonna be looking to either side of these buildings and will it be finished off to look like the rest of the uh, structures that are around that when in fact, again, instead of having fully dimensioned uh, joist material that's present there for structural supports, again, we've got the parallel cord wood trusses, or we may have a combination of old and new that may be present there that has been left in place. So again, you've got to be able to almost have x-ray vision to be able to see beyond what's apparent and have that building intel from a pre-incident standpoint. Conversions of type three are gonna be challenging at best. And again, when we have buildings that are being renovated, understanding commercial type structures, just knowing in advance of what those size of factors and those conditions very well may be. Commercial mixed use construction, all the way up to alterations and renovations that normally uh, occur over decades of time which primarily says you've got to be monitoring your buildings and those hybrids that again, we've got to be able to know them in advance of our arrival. And the fact that these hybrid type structures will not follow conventional rules of engagement upon, uh, upon on scene. And again, more often than not, it's the renovations that are going to trigger those aspects. Here we have a one story commercial building, uh, retail. Again, it's being renovated. That original roof system now has a single slope uh, roof that has both engineered and conventional construction, or we have a type two constructed building here with again, a type five constructed lightweight engineered wood truss roof system with voids with a complexity of uh, engineered systems in place. So again, once this gets covered over, parapets get put into place, will you have a knowledge to understand what is gonna happen and go in? all the way to podium, mass timber construction. So the challenges are, are present in all of our settings, all the way from the urbanized rural, uh, urbanized metro uh, element, all the way to the wildland interface. Influencing factors are gonna be the structural engineered systems, our residentials with large area residentials, mass timber construction, podium construction, cross laminate timber, CLT, large area commercial buildings and so forth. So just, again, keeping up with construction types and the kinds of things that we presently have 
are things that one has to consider in the size of considerations. Some of the influencing aspects, rapidly changing building materials, methods of construction, aging buildings, influence of fire load packages, as well as susceptibility to compromise and collapse. We've said this a couple of times, it's much more than just stretching the line and going in. First do size up. Again, each and every day we spend a lot of time in the streets, in quarters, waiting for those alarms to come in. We go out in the streets and again, we have a certain perception, we have a certain expectation that the rules of engagement and our ability to operate are going to be present. And unfortunately, today's buildings don't follow the rules of engagement of 10, 15, 20, or 30 years ago. The challenges that our companies are facing is assessing both the fire conditions that may be present or may not be. You may arrive with nothing showing, and we've recognized that nothing showing does not equate to a nothing type fire. That again, we may have ventilation limiting conditions. And again, you may have a deep seated fire upon entry. We create a uh, vent path and a flow path. And again, we suddenly now have fire that uh, becomes very obvious as we progress into that structure more and more. The rules of engagement of the construction and assessing the buildings. Again, some things may appear to be challenging, but again, if we're able to assess construction, material, understand the layout, have a level of skill set and confidence, both at the command and at the company level to direct our companies to initiate engagement based upon a perceived or known level of risk that we understand relative to the company's capabilities or limitations, and we go to work in whatever mode or capacity, it's all gonna be driven by what we identify, what we assess, what we predict, what we size up, what we consider, and hopefully it's all based upon valid assumptions and that we're not just flying by the seat of our pants upon arrival. Our buildings on fire are gonna be, again, based upon construction type, in the past, it used to be buildings on fire, it used to be construction type, it used to be an occupancy type. We've got a residential occupancy, we've got fire showing, the degree of fire involvement, we go to work. That was usually construction based tactics upon our operational arrival. But it's much more than that. We take a look at our buildings, fire dynamics, conditions, is it commercial, is it residential, and we go to work with either limited or adequate resources. Those challenges for many of us are, are quite, quite often not based upon experiences that we've gotten in the past. Commercial sized residential buildings of 10,000 square feet or more that again have challenging outcomes that we hopefully survive. What doesn't kill us hopefully makes us stronger when we take a look at those elements. And again, it's a combination of all of these aspects. It's our close calls, it's our learnings, it's information from research and information from UL and NIST. It's line of duty death uh, NIOSH reports. It's the stuff that we talk about at the kitchen table. It's the things that we reflect upon. It's the stuff that we do day in and day out. It's taking all of these and putting them together. We talk about working in the streets and sizing up our buildings. And it's understanding the, the aspects of occupancy type and risk and how they translate very differently upon our arrival and when we go to work. Let's pause here for a minute. Let me just... Uh, let me jump ahead here a moment. <clears throat> I'm monitoring our time phase here, so I wanna be able to uh, jump ahead a little bit. <clears throat> Again, I'd normally be asking for a lot of questions if anybody's out there, but again, uh, again, if you do have questions that are, arise out of the presentation, please feel free to send me an email and we'll try to address those, uh, those items for you. First, do size of what does size of look like? So if we talk about conventional size of the building, the fire ground, and the fire, we've introduced some of those particular concepts. Again, some of the things that we've been talking about here, conventional size up, 
Again, there's a whole variety of those elements. You can take a look at them relative to any particular textbook on tactics, operations, the fundamentals, and so forth, the process and, and what size up normally may mean. Let's run through a couple of different elements of size of first and foremost. There's a classical Lloyd Lehman size of originated in the 1950s that many have still utilized. Rescue, exposure, confinement, extinguishment, overhaul, ventilation, and salvage. Again, the classical five-step process that the Lloyd Lehman introduced in 1953 that we still utilize to this day in many instances, along with some slight variations that some of our colleagues have written about that we'll talk about here in a moment. Facts, the things that you know, probabilities, our own situation, decisions, decision, uh, 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 key decision, tactical points, plans and operations, the, the initial development of what we call their incident action plans back in the day. But again, first do size up is what Lloyd Lay Layman had given us in 1953 that still exists to a greater degree today. The one individual who really optimized that and took it a step forward was uh, uh, Chief John Norman. But again, in 1972, in 72, Emanuel Freed, retired BC out of FDNY, gave us the first elements of introducing building characteristics, time of fire, life safety considerations that Chief Brunacini expanded upon extensively under the fire ground command concepts in the 1980s. But in 1972, bringing forward much of the learnings coming out of FDNY, out of the urban environment, started talking about the building. Building height, building characteristics of area, construction, occupancy, and fire location. So again, Lloyd Lehman in the Red Book, 1972 Fire Ground Tactics, started talking about evaluating the building and size up, expanding upon Lloyd Lehman's concepts. Coal was wealth, again, fundamentally the classics of Chief John Norman, occupancy, area potential, life, water supply, apparatus personnel, street considerations, weather, and so forth. But again, some of this has become somewhat extraneous and we'll, we'll reinforce that as we go forward. But for many of you, Cole was wealth is the acronym that still stays with us, but again, needs to be expanded upon. Bob Pressler, Lieutenant Bob Pressler, FDNY, utilizes a very simple approach of the acronym of BELOW, building extent, life hazard, occupancy, and then water. Anthony Avillo out of New Jersey, Frank Ritchie out of uh, Connecticut. Again, uh, although the acronym doesn't give us a clear indication, again, they started talking about building construction, occupancy, the layout, fire location upon arrival, and fire location extension and progress. So again, some critical factors here that again are focusing in. They're starting to narrow in as the fundamentals that are part of our building facts, concept, and methodologies and models. So building, occupancy, layout, fire location, upon arrival, and then fire location extent and fire progress during the ensuing elements. Mark Emery out of Washington, the big six. Again, as you can see here, again, some aspects of size up, uh, of status of life safety. Now, Mark was very highly influenced by Chief Runacini in the uh, Phoenix Fireground Modeling, knowing the problem, the big six, again, investigation mode, determining the risk versus value, and so forth. So again, a very um, complex level of size of, that gets into a lot of other underlying elements. Again, very much uh, influenced by the Brunacini, both blue card currently, as well as the classical fireground commander methodologies and models born out of the mid 1980s, all the way through the philosophy and development of the fireground uh, model into the 1980s. Chuck Ryan out of Virginia, again, confirmation of uh, incident address, the type of structure, what is evident, water supply plans, layout, location, and then going to work. An unsighted, very simple ABCD, address, building description, what are the conditions, deployment, and directive. So again, e for many of you, utilize, you utilize a combination of any one of these, especially with the ABCs. You know, we're on scene at a particular uh, address. It's a building description, including the occupancy conditions and then deployment, what we're going to do. So it follows both the Brunacini model, follows some of the fundamentals of the Lloyd Lehman, certainly follows the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, John Norman uh, aspect of Cole was wealth, 
but again, sometimes it's very limiting and doesn't have some of those insights uh, from that. Uh, Murray Laughlin's uh, from Virginia, initial size up, initial risk assessment, command structure incident and action plan, structural geographics, functional designation, and then safety. The Brunacini blue card, structural size up, building size up, occupancy type, name, fire conditions, initial fire attack or tactical task level, offensive, tactical priorities, report, and progress. Slicers, which again um, is part of the evolving trends, um, both process, both model, both size up, both uh, a bunch of different things. So again, we'll just, we'll just present this from the standpoint, again, size up, locate, identify, cool, extinguish, and rescue. We'll leave it as it is because again, some of you are utilizing slicers as a size up method. We just wanted to present that as a, another element in the microcosm of what's occurring nationally or on a localized level. And then uh, a, an emerging concept or process from uh, Jesse Quinalti, for some of you that have seen it on the East Coast, Jess is on the West Coast, the West Coast firefighter. And again, he utilizes the acronym or term uh, slab saver. Again, influenced by the European uh, concepts, which includes uh, safety profiling, life profiling, air tracks, in particular building search and rescue, attack, ventilate, <coughs> extension and exposure, RIT, and then salvage. So all of these are very influencing in nature and terminology and methodologies. Some of us still uh, utilize in our locales, in our regions, and our authorities, uh, the size up forms, again, size up forms and the tactical worksheets that were introduced back in the mid to late 1980s, institutionalized through the 90s, and in many jurisdictions have gone away. They've uh, been replaced by iPads and various other electronic forms or the command vehicles with their tactical control sheets and so forth. But for many of us uh, utilizing tactical worksheets upon arrival, especially at the company level, uh, which eventually were transferred over and reverted to command at the stationary command zone, again, uh, sometimes can be a handicap. They, they are efficient and effective in many ways. They can be utilized in a variety of ways, but if you're utilizing these as a check the box type of format, um, again, it's gonna be a challenge. You may be handicapped and working uh, with one or, or both hands behind your back right from the get-go. The critical element here is to utilize critical thinking based upon knowledge, skills, and abilities that, again, are skill set level based that are developed skills to you, for you to utilize critical thinking while you're observing and, and getting this feedback from the building while you're doing your observations to understand, comprehend what I'm seeing based upon const construction knowledge, based upon understanding fire, based upon all of these, these very fluid parameters that have to be quickly identified individually marry together, have them materialize in a picture, identify and differentiate the important from the extraneous, then be able to identify and predict what importance they may have in terms of priority, then be able to communicate that to those that are coming in that has value. Don't just recite something for the sake of reciting it because your SOPs say, I've got to say this upon arrival. And that's where we get into these levels of helping to support knowledge, skills, and abilities for that first due relative to construction that influence tactics that have an influence on safety. So first arriving, construction tactics and safety, the acronym of BEAR, building, era, and vintage, the building anatomy, and the level of risk that are all part of the size up parameters that we're gonna give you some more insights on that build upon what other elements here. The other five elements include building anatomy, occupancy type and occupancy risk. What is the building's collapse and compromise characteristics? Based upon when the building was built, what is the effectiveness and the impacts of material and methods of construction? And the fifth item is the fire dynamics. So those five factors influence our size up that give you important information that's gonna influence my operations. Let's jump ahead here. So again, when we talk about reading the building, let me just backstab it. When you look at a building, what are you seeing? What are you observing? What are you comprehending? Do you have the ability to filter out? Identify, discern, and assess what is the predictability? What is the building's writ? What is the building's resiliency, integrity, 
relative to time. And that time window is going to be that 10 minute element. And again, it's going to also be part of what we just talked about, those five critical elements regarding the acronym of BEAR. Having the ability to focus in on the severity, the urgency, and the growth, apply, communicate, and obviously act. Act at the command level, act at the tactical company level, which again, are going to be distinguishedly different. Recognize this, there's going to be a different type of read the building at the tactical command level, and upon arrival, information that may be communicated back to command or the command size up, the command is going to initiate because they're going to be looking at the building and those conditions in a different perspective with a different set of, of glasses, with a different set of parameters that are building upon, again, information that the company is giving, information that they're hearing that's being communicated via radio, information that's coming across possibly on the uh, mobile digital terminals, it's coming off the CADs, coming off of building Intel and in whatever format, or utilizing, again, that flip, trying to pull out the right uh, three-ring binder, or pulling out the right information on the iPad that's gonna give you some data. However antiquated and old, or however highly technological and advanced that you're, that you're utilizing. Again, when you look at those conditions, again, are we able to differentiate, are we able to comprehend, discern, and filter, and it fundamentally goes back to building affected issues, fire-related elements within the comp compromising conditions, new or old. Are conditions, elements, parts of that building, are they functional? Are they aesthetic? Is it there merely as an appearance, or do they have a functional element that are going to impact your buildings and operation? Are there features of the building that we are able to discern? Do we have real or do we have fake types of firewalls or dormers? or conditions within the buildings. The construction and elements may or may not be obvious. Again, I can look at a building, and sure it's going to look like a multiple occupancy structure, but in this instance, it's a podium constructed building that upon completion, I need to differentiate because I have type one construction on the lower one or two stories. I have a very complex engineered construction of wood that's located on the upper floor, four stories. Do I know that I might have a different type of floor system in terms of arrangement? I now have upper floors that may have large spaces, spacious areas of volumes that may be far different than the lower, uh, least expensive floors and, and compartments and apartments. I may have 20 apartments on the upper floor I may have double those apartments on the lower floors. I may have single unit occupancies. I may have one bedroom apartments on the lower floor. I may have large spaces, spatial spaces that may have three, four or five bedrooms along with multiple spaces and so forth on upper floors. So these are all part of those related aspects. And again, comprehension and understanding, it goes back to building, construction, age, vintage, modifications over errors, things that are predictable, things that need to be sized up within the least amount of time. A highly effective company or command officer should be able to do a read on a building within 90 or 120 seconds at most, at most be able to comprehend, filter, discern, assess, and be able to communicate critical factors to, again, those that are responding and such all the way through there. And that includes any of the construction. So first and foremost, what are you typically responding to develop and expand your skill set level on those particular buildings? And then as you get to the other buildings that may be less susceptible due to construction and materials, you can start developing that skill set in those related conditions. But again, what is occurring under renovation? Once things are sealed up, once things are covered over, now literally we have to have that x-ray vision. You've got to have this level of knowledge of what it is that when you're on street side to be able to look at that building and recognize where the columns may be, where the voids may be present, how factors of a building are gonna play out and influence your operation at any given point in time. Now normally we'd be asking for a lot of information and insights on what we're looking at here, but again, as you guys, again, guys and gals, when you guys look at these particular images uh, afterwards or scope through them, Take a look at these images, take a look at some of the factors that may be present in there. Again, all of these things are going to copy, be, be part of those elements that are going to give you an understanding of operations, 
considerations and factors. So this was would be part of a more interactive series of slides and, and going back through just looking at these elements. So just a, a quick little level of insight. Um, take a couple of slides of some elements there. To, again, we were in these series of slides, we only go back here a minute. Again, you can take a look at just reading the building. Just look at and getting photographs of some of your first do. And again, simple series of questions. These particular bullets and ask the, the, the individuals in that drill setting what it is. If I have fire in there, what is the severity? What is the urgency of a given fire in certain parts of that building? What are the aspects of reading that building? What are the aspects of reading the fire compartment? So again, same series of questions here in terms of benchmarking, tactical windows, and, and so forth. So again, we're reading the building, we're reading the compartment and the fire. And then lastly, um, through these series of Q&As as part of that size up, again, reading the fire ground. Again, what are you looking at relative to these particular series of bullets as they relate back to the fire ground and then looking at that. So early on in our program, we talked about building compartment and company. It's again, it's looking and reading both the building, reading the fire, and then reading the fire ground. These are actually part of that uh, collective el element of uh, quantum tactics. Four key areas of today's fire ground in terms of the reads. And let me jump ahead to that uh, series here in a moment. So again, we do have a whole series of fire ground assessments and I'm just looking at our, our time factors here right now that we don't have the ability to uh, jump into. But let me, <clears throat> let me just jump ahead here. And as you see, for those of you that are interested in some of the more expansive elements here of the program, send me an email along uh, with uh, your email address and I'll send you some excerpts out of this PDF, uh, out of the program as a PDF. So again, there's some things here that uh, do have merit for some conversation and discussion, but due to the, some of the limitations on our time window here, I, I will not have the ability to jump into them. I'm just looking at a couple of critical elements here. Again, there's gonna be a series of elements here on predictability performance that uh, you very well may have some interest in, which is gonna lead me back to a couple of items here. So, <clears throat> all right, we talked about five critical elements on the fire ground. So it's understanding building construction, assessing that risk management, behavioral elements back to the firefighter, incident management, and situational safety. These are part of what we call the five-star command model. Our quantum tactics, as far as the core elements of our reads, it's reading the fire ground, reading the building, it's reading smoke and fire behavior. So now again, Chief Dotson over many years uh, um, has given us some insights on reading smoke, compartment related issues, and again, that has always been fundamental. We expanded that years ago in terms of reading the fire ground, reading the building, reading the smoke regarding the compartment, reading your company, and again, which gives us back to these fundamentals. So fundamentally, when we take a look at those aspects, they give us tactical windows of our operations for the first arriving, decision points, demands and levels of risk that are associated with them that give us an influence on actions and tasks. So the core relationship of those is that building compartment and company, that tactical edge to what we call uh, quantum tactics is reading the fire ground, reading the building, reading smoke and fire behavior, and reading the company, which goes back to the three fundamental areas of our discussions. All of these are time determinant, goes back to building compartment and occupancy, fire severity and urgency and growth, which gives us our priorities, gives us a level to optimize what it is that we're looking at and trying to share relative to that observations, relative to the communications, relative to the task level actions, all of which are gonna be based upon skill basis. So again, our limitations and capabilities on these and the time determinant factors are gonna be going back to how good or bad is the company. How good or bad are they at deploying that line? How good or bad are they at, at stretching the line going in and doing what's necessary relative to optimization of the company, 
based upon skills and effectiveness and efficiencies. Building compartment stability, the RIT element, fire behavior and dynamics, severity and aspects, time determinant, resources, and well as resiliency. Usually have lots of ideas at the task level. Got a lot, <laughs> again, we're getting more of than that. We got to do something. The buildings and fire influence or define our operations. Sometimes the turn, we turn the corner, time to go to work. Again, are we assessing what it is that we're looking at or are we just stretching the line and going in? What and how you do, what we and how we do it, when will define the mission, the operations, and the outcome toward that. We have first due levels is we have building risks, we have occupancy risks, we also have at risk behaviors relative to the companies. All of those collectively get put into place when we talk about building facts and operations. That facts and model. <clears throat> are based upon these influencing factors of the building reads. The era and vintage, the building anatomy, the, the occupancy risk and occupancy types of which there's an expanded element and module, but just recognize that that is part of that process. The mission critical reads of assessment include roof, perimeter walls, floors, compartment, and the voids. Those five critical elements that are built upon these particular characteristics start giving you the critical building intel that help define operations. Era, vintage, anatomy, and risks, influencing factors on that first arriving uh, construction tactics and safety model. Building predictability. Again, this is much more than just covering through a couple of uh, bullets and uh, slides and so forth. This is a much more in-depth level, but there are predictabilities of building occupancy types that one can learn that are inherent and trixic, things that are adaptive as well as the new, that are all built upon the building codes and standards that are out there. The era and vintage are defined by either decades or periods of construction. They relate back to architectural and engineering practices. They are all highly predictable. And again, if we can take those elements of architecture and engineering based upon methods and materials when they were built, they give us a predictability that once we learn them, and understand how they're affected by fire conditions. They relate back to the building anatomy and integrity and their key elements and our size of factors on today's fire ground. The anatomy aspects include those five elements that I've talked about a number of times, construction systems, occupancy type, use, and risk. What are the collapse and compromising characteristics? They may be negligible, meaning that if there is a, if the only thing that may happen is a limited potential compromise, then that gets taken out of the picture that allows us more latitude of operational time, gives us a method and material of construction. All of this is influenced by fire dynamics, both in terms of the structure, that stuff that's gonna be within the voids and the conditions within the compartment relative to fire dynamics, relative to the fire load package, fire dynamics relative to fire within the structure and the building's anatomy of considerations. The risk considerations include resiliency, uh, resilience, resiliency, resistance, integrity, and time. They relate back to the occupancy type and go back to a risk matrix based on severity and probability. So again, fundamentally, those three elements, building, type, era, compartment, floor, roof, building, or the block, company, team, at the company level, team, company, in the box. Integrates a five-star modeling. So when we take a look at that, here's the other big takeaway. When I'm sizing up our building, we talked about five metal pieces. I'm sizing up, I'm looking at construction types, anatomy and systems, oxygen type and risk, collapse and compromise, methods and materials, and the fire dynamics. These become the foundation of everything that we're building upon regarding a new set of factors to look at our buildings. If I can assess any building, any occupancy related back to these five fundamentals, along with these couple of other pieces that we've identified thus far, we've simplified a process that's all built upon how that building and fire is going to be affecting us, and it'll give us the kinds of insights 
that are critical, mission critical, today's operating in today's structural fire operations. So the model we've talked about, era, vintage, compartment resources, this becomes a fundamental piece. So if nothing else in this short session, if we can start looking at these fundamental pieces along with the concept of bear, along with that five-star command, these fundamentally coupled with those five other elements of construction systems, collapse and compromise, occupancy risks, the methods and materials, again, going back to when they were built, and the fire dynamics. These are the most critical two pieces that fall into play regarding understanding and sizing up that predictability modeling. Because again, they in turn will give us the insights on first two tactics, civilian life safety, and our ability to, ability to integrate and operate within that structure. So you can start seeing that there's a series of insights that become skill and knowledge base that primarily says we've got to be looking at our buildings differently. You've got to build upon a foundation of knowledge in order for us to be able to assess those with a level of knowledge and insight that are focused in on critical mission elements. Again, filtering key elements that goes well beyond what some of the things that the coal is wealth or the layman models or any of the other previous models have given us. Each one either had extraneous information or too much information that sometimes are given, whereas what we wanna be assessing and looking at are mission critical relative to building integrity, because where is it that I'm operating? I'm either gonna be in the building, underneath something, or somewhere around, or on top of, or underneath. Roof, ventilation, perimeter walls, laddering, accessing, inside compartments. These are all factors, again, of where our personnel are going to be. Understanding the building's inherent predictability coupled with the fire aspects of predictability relative to fire load and dynamics, all gives us those variables that are gonna give us the ability to operate in a structural conditions. A much more adaptive approach versus prescriptive approach, integrating, again, models, methods, practices, and considerations. Couple of key items, let me just uh, pop here to, uh, <clears throat> to one key item here again. When we talk about these elements, so again, we had the graphics here that we talked about, these five particular elements, the five-star command. Again, this is an expanded element we talk about sizing up, especially when we talk about looking at that from the, the 360. So again, our time limitations and our, our presentation here are not going to allow us, but there's some key insights that we further expand upon. So each one of these areas that are building upon primarily relies on pre-incident knowledge or insights or learnings. Knowledge, skills, and abilities that you've got to learn prior to getting on scene and, and putting this model in place, of which when we take a look at perimeter walls, again, we've tried to limit it to the key elements of, a, of five or six key bullet points. Again, if I'm looking at a perimeter wall of type three construction that was built in an era of the late 1800s. Again, late 1800s, which may be entirely different than early 1920s. That perimeter wall may or may not be built with, with the reinforcements based upon when it was built. We may be looking at key elements. Do, do I have any type of reinforcements there? Or do I have any type of spreader plates that were added on to provide additional support to them? Do I have cracks and, and aspects dealing with uh, various types of joints that's going to affect that wall prematurely? Do I have characteristics of bowing that are going to affect the building that already may be structurally inherently deficient before I even put my personnel in there that might influence you to even put your personnel in or to have a consideration that my tactical window now may be five minutes or eight minutes to initiate a certain uh, initiation inside of that building, do a primary and get out of that structure and go defensive. Because again, there will be factors that are going to be highly influencing building integrity based upon what you're looking at. So again, we've actually created a uh, building facts sheet for various types of structures. That's all part of our size of uh, considerations here. And let me just show you. So although we, we are not going to be able to get into it uh, in this particular session, I will show you, um, we do have some considerations here that again, if we're fortunate enough to present this in its full version in 2021 in Ocean City, which we're hoping to, uh, we will get into some of these details. 
if you're fortunate enough to see some of our more expanded programs, both some versions online, we've got both uh, four, six, and eight hour versions of these programs that we are self-producing online, keep an eye out for them on our various websites. Uh, again, we, we've got a whole series of insights on our building construction series, since we do a lot on building construction and integrate our tactics on performance and tactical windows. But these tactical windows have levels of risk. And again, another part of this risk model, when I'm sizing up my building, actually gets into a risk severity. If you're able to uh, take a look at the one particular uh, program, and that would be, um, I'm look, actually I'm looking at a couple of other sheets here. If you take a look at the, if you take a look at the double line of duty death in Philadelphia from 2012, uh, we actually introduced and vetted out this risk management model uh, based upon risk severity and, and operational probability. That particular NIOSH report, along with two others, the Southwest in fire in uh, Houston, Texas, along with a single line of duty death in a commercial building fire in Michigan, all give some insights on the severity model. So this severity model also builds upon and gives you some of those risk factors, again, looking at roof, looking at occupancy, looking at perimeter walls, compartments, and so forth. So I don't want to sit, give you the false impression that there's just a quick and easy down and dirty uh, acronym that will give you all the insights. What we're giving you is a model approach based upon building facts. So the model is first arriving, construction, tactics, and safety, of which the BEAR acronym, the Five Star Command, and some of these other processes are built upon that do give you a highly efficient process and method to look at a particular occupancy within your arrival, initiate a very rapid and very effective size up with the parameters of what it is it that I need to look at based upon that building. Once I've, I've hopefully assessed when it was built within a certain time frame. Again, sometimes you can be very accurate. Sometimes it's going to be within a given span of time. If I can look at that and assess it, put into place some of these elements here regarding the assessment models that again gives you in indicators of severity, looks at five critical elements as we discussed, relates that back to an occupancy and has this kind of spreadsheet that again can give you a predictability performance, we actually have that ability to uh, operate in a much more effective manner. So I know I'm jumping around a little bit here, but again, um, for those of you that are interested, uh, we actually did a program at FDIC a couple of years ago. We vetted this out. Here's one of our sheets that, again, just looks at building facts for type three ordinary construction and some of the key elements of predictability, adaptive fire ground management, gives you some factors of risk assessment and some of the key elements of looking at building, compartment and company and what those reads may be. So quick and dirty, but the kind of things that we're talking about here that one can develop the skill set. So it's really a matter of reprogramming ourselves, reprogramming ourselves at the command and at the company level, understanding time commitments, more importantly, just understanding how will that building perform relative to fire load, looking at it from a building predictability standpoint and providing a process and methodology that will allow you to do all of this in a much more efficient and standardized measure that does take into account everything that we've learned in the past, but primarily reprograms ourselves to become more efficient with a set of parameters on today's fire ground. The overall model is actually this here, which we'll leave for another day. But this predictability of model is actually what we are talking about here when we talk about, again, this model and building facts, size of considerations and how it fits together is a learned process that is highly effective and efficient based on what we've actually done and vetted this into the streets with. But again, it should influence strategic management and help direct tactical engagement. All of these elements come together to give us the building's facts model, give us some different ways of sizing up today's buildings on a very dy dynamic fire ground while integrating some of the elements that, again, um, research is giving us. It gives us the value of much of what we've learned from our learnings, the value of the kitchen table discussion. So again, we're not saying we're gonna reinvent it, 
what we're saying is we're going to fine tune some things for tomorrow's fires while still utilizing and building upon the values, the methodologies, and the practices that still allow us to aggressively and intelligently go into our buildings, but do so with a level of building knowledge that equates back to a managed level of risk to be who we are, and that's the American Fire Service. Again, each and every day, each and every tour, it's our oath, our duty, our mission, it's our tradition, it's our obligation, it's our brotherhood. It's also our responsibility and our love for the job and those that allow us to do what we do. Honor, reverence, and learning. Again, be the best you possibly are going to be each and every day. I thank you for listening in and, and watching this uh, uh, episode and this particular uh, session of what would have been our stand-up delivery program at the 2020 Maryland State Farben's uh, Association Conference. I want to thank the association and all those that were involved for certainly allowing me the, uh, the latitude and the luxury of uh, presenting to you here with this particular format. Again, we did a little jumping around, uh, a lot of different pieces here that uh, we weren't able to get to that I know about that you don't, unfortunately. But again, for those of you that are interested in uh, some further information on, on these particular concepts, again, we are training uh, nationally. Hopefully, we'll be uh, somewhere in your backyard or uh, in your various counties or around the various states. See us at any of the uh, major conferences once we get back up and running, certainly in 2020. We do have a comprehensive program uh, at uh, FDIC that will be coming out on uh, a fire officer's guide to today's buildings on fire, which we'll get into one segment. We'll spend a whole hour talking about size up methodologies. We're gonna have some online resources. We're gonna to try to work with the association to maybe give you some additional uh, insights here in the months ahead dedicated to the uh, Maryland State uh, Firefighters Association. So keep looking out for that information. If there's anything I can do for anybody out there, please feel free to uh, email me, uh, look me up on our social media. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. We've got our blogs and uh, Facebook pages. Just do a quick, quick Google search and you'll uh, find a way to get a hold of me. So stay safe, keep learning, and uh, we'll see you sometime in person down along the road. So. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.